Can we maybe to introduce you very briefly? Up to okay. you, yeah. Hi. Um, hi, everyone. Welcome to Oxford Books. This is our third talk. And tonight's speaker is, um, in English pronunciation, Jerome Van Duren. And in Dutch, is Jerome. Van Jeroen Van Doren. Jeroen yeah. Van Doren. And uh, Jerome is a London based artist, researcher, and writer. And he just graduated. This is actually, this talk, this very long title, is part of your PhD work. Yeah. Right? Yeah. And, um, and this is from 2020, at the RCA. Yeah. And now Jerome teaches at London College of Communications and also Leeds. Leeds, Leeds yeah. University. Leeds Art University as well. Yeah, yeah. as well. And um, tonight's talk is actually a crossover between art and literature. And that's why the bookshop is hosting it. And the book I'm sure you will hear a lot about it, is uh, Fernando Pessoa's The Book of Disquiet, and he's this Portuguese poet that, in his writing career, he adopts multiple personalities of persona, um, and this has inspired Jerome's art practice, and he's going to share why, how, what, etc. Right, okay, yeah. please. Okay. Um, so yeah, I'm going to talk about uh, Fernando Pessoa and the book in relation to my practice. So you're going to see a lot of artworks, but I explain the book as well and how I look at the book and why it inspired me. Um, there's going to be quite a lot of text because it's related to the book and sometimes I make comparisons and there's some writing about my own characters as well. Um, I don't expect you to read all of it because it will go too quick for that. Um, but if you have any questions, you can ask, ask, uh, can ask later. Um, if you want to go back to it, we can just go back to it. Or if you want to have the slideshow, I don't mind sharing the slideshow if you want to have that afterwards, um, if you want to kind of go over it in a, in a bit of a slower pace. Um, if you have questions, I don't mind, if there's an urgent question, I don't mind having a question in between. Um, I don't get distracted by that too much. I might finish my talking, but then if you just raise your hand, I will see it and we can discuss it that way. Or you can keep it till the end and we just discuss it in the end. Um, so I think one of the main things we need to talk about is heterodyms. Um, to be able to understand um, Fernando Pessoa, you kind of need to know what a heteronym is. So a heteronym is, is it refers to one or more imaginary, imaginary characters uh, created by a writer to write in a different style or to write from a different perspective. Um, the main thing about this is, is that it's imaginary character. So with a pseudonym you adopt a name and you can write in a different style as well. But you don't have that, that character that's kind of driving the writing or is driving the practice. Uh, so it's, that's the main thing. So um, one of the things um, I guess to start the book is that... Um, hi Vicky. Hi. Um, is um, he had a lot of them. Um, the numbers are not clear. The latest number is 137, but some say 82. So it depends on who you talk to and who is writing about him. They come up with different numbers. Um, so he had a lot of them. Some were heteronyms, some were semi heteronyms, some were more aliases, some were autonyms, or you can only have one autonym. Um, so he had different ways of, of kind of presenting these, um, these personas or these kind of imaginary characters. Um, the book wasn't finished in his, in his lifetime. Um, he, uh, he started more or less from 1914, and it wasn't finished when he died in 1935. Fernando uh, Pessoa was a, a Portuguese modernist writer. Um, let me put that in there as well. Um, so he lived from, nine, from 1888 to 1935. Um, and throughout kind of that, that phase, he, he kept writing about, uh, about the book and about different fragments of the book. Um, so when it was finished, that trunk, uh, um, they found this trunk with about 25,000 something um, different notepacks and different articles and different writings. Um, and they're still sifting through it. They still haven't translated everything. They still haven't um, figured everything out where it belongs to. Um, luckily, there was one big envelope in the trunk, which was the, 
related to the, the book of uh, Disquiet. Um, and even within the trunk, besides the envelope, there's still certain um, writing that they kind of move towards, um, towards the book. Um, um, he marked them with Book of Disquiet, but then in Portuguese, um, which I can't pronounce, so I'm not gonna, do, not gonna try that. Um, and the, so I think one of the things is that he is called a factless biography. Um, the factless biography, he, what he means with that is that it is based on the imaginary character. So it's not based on fact, but it's reading as if it's an autobiography. So it's talking about uh, the character, uh, Fernando uh, Soares, um, and it's talking about his inner life, his inner feelings, his ideas, some of it is more um, psychological text or philosophical text or um, more daily wanderings um, and it's so it's not so much that you get an idea how he lives it's more you get an idea how he thinks and how he kind of um, how he thinks about himself and about his life um, the book is really fragmented so I think that's a really important thing to look at um, so if you look in the book they are kind of Kind of divided in different texts to define, so they're just numbered with different texts, um, different numbers. And so, what that does to the book is that there is no linear line within the book. Um, some of the text they found was dated, so you kind of can place it more or less within within a timeline. But other ones, there's not no date, and it's not clear how it will follow. And there's many versions of the book of this book. Different people have. Um, made an attempt of, of putting it all together. Um, I personally like this the best, but I, I, I'm sure there's other people that disagree with me. Uh, I'm sure there's a lot of people that are gonna disagree with things. I will say tonight, um, it is part of, of kind of the unfinished, um, kind of the unfinishedness that he did not finish it himself. So other people kind of give an interpretation of what he might have thought the book might have looked like. Um, I know a lot of people when they read a book they skip over the introduction. Um, here I wouldn't skip over the introduction. It is the same as I would go to the back of the book to Appendix 3. In Appendix 3 there's um, readings how he thought how the book should be together. Not together but how his ideas about the book. Um, so I would read that before I would read the book, and I read, definitely would read the introduction, um, so you have an idea how, kind of how he thinks, how he thinks about the book, how he thinks about writing, and kind of to have an idea what kind of person he was as well, because it's important in relation to the book. Um, I'm kind of saying that this is important because, um, you know, if you, if you look at the, um, at the Appendix 3, for example, there's different text about how he was struggling and how he was thinking about the book. Um, so, you know, he says a few times, like, it, it's all um, fragments, fragments, fragments. Um, he kind of, you know, he says, my present state of mind is of deep and calm depression. For some days now, I've been at the level of the Book of Disquiet. Just today, I wrote almost an entire chapter. But it's not really clear what chapter it is or what he is referring to, but he has been struggling for a long time because you see here, those letters are dated 1914 and he died in 1935. So after 21 years, he was still not finished with the book. So there was a lot of this struggle and this kind of thinking of how he could, um, how he could put the book together. Um, then there is the, that's why I started with explaining what a heteronym is. Um, the book, you can consider it more or less as three different writers. So two of his heteronyms, and then himself more or less as himself, and sometimes they, some people say more as him as an autonym. Uh, autonym is that you use your own name, but you kind of have a fictional, uh, like a fictionalized self, but you use your own name. So Fernando Pessoa can be just himself, 
but it can also be a fictional character that he kind of that comes from him. Um, some people also he calls it at one point as well that it's um, one of the characters that written the book, uh, Bernardo Suarez, that he is a semi heteronym. So what he says for that is that um, it's not a complete heteronym because some of it is, is again based on himself and not on somebody else. So this again, if you, if you look at the book and about his way of thinking about the book and kind of the struggles, he started in the beginning uh, with the character of Vincent Guedes. So if you look back at this, uh, this part, he was still thinking that, um, that Vincent uh, wrote the book or is going to write the book. Um, if you then look in, that's why I'm going in between the introduction and the third appendix. If you go to the third appendix, you see that um, the, the first bit is that he kind of wants to change some of the text into more psychology of Bernardo Suarez to kind of rewrite the whole book so the book can be attributed, which he wanted in the end, to Bernardo Suarez. Um, so the book up to that point, a lot of it was written in the different character in, into uh, Vicente Guedes. And about in 19, I think it was 1928, he kind of started changing and he started rewriting certain things in a different style. Um, so the different style is really important because for him to distinguish the different um, heteronyms was about, you know, the different style of writing. So he would come up with a fictional character, which in this case was a bookkeeper living in Lisbon, uh, living in a certain apartment on the fourth floor. And um, based on those um, givens and based on how he would develop the character, um, he would start writing as thinking as, as in a way as that specific uh, character I had to name. Um, so in this instance, he, he kind of, um, he had to rewrite everything because it needed to be in a different style, it needed to be in a specific character. So that's why it switched. And then you can see his voice coming through as well. And that's something I'm really interested in, in how his voice comes through in, in the book. Um, in a way in relation to the other characters, but also just as a voice himself. Um, so this is, it, is text 299. Um, I hope, I think that book is probably more or less the same as what I have. Uh, so you can find, that's why I didn't use page numbers, because if you use page numbers, it's really difficult to find it back. So I used the 299. If you have the same book, it's page 254. Uh, but so you have all these texts and here he came with, I've created various personalities within. I constantly create personalities. It's of my dreams as soon as I start dreaming, it is immediately in, incarnated in another person. Um, so in this instance, you can have in a way two different ways of thinking about this. One is it's per Fernando Pessoa his voice in the book saying, okay, I, um, I invent multiple characters and um, he puts himself in the book and there's a conversation with the book. It could be that he didn't rewrite this into the character of Bernanda Soares or he thought um, that Bernanda Soares actually invents fictional characters or heteronyms as well. Um, it's not a whole spent a hundred percent clear because he didn't say it's you know this is the meaning I'm giving to the book or to this voice within this text um, it does belong in the book so it's kind of you can again have multiple interpretations and there will be you know you can have discussions about this as well who is right and what's the right interpretation um, because at the same time he says uh, Fernando Suarez wrote the book um, so, because he didn't finish it, it's not clear how, how this piece of text, and there's m multiple pieces of text like this throughout the book that you can assign to him as a person when he starts to talk about um, 
creating personas or talking about different, um, um, finding different uh, ideas of, of, of writing um, that you could assign to, to, to a different character. Um, but yeah, so the whole book is kind of like that. It's um, in a way the background, that's why I said you have to know more about the background. It's really interesting to read and sometimes slightly complicated, but if you read the book, it's, it's really easy to read, I find. And it's beautiful written. Um, and also because we all lately are distracted by all our uh, devices, the texts are really short, so you can you know, read one or two or three and you can pick up whatever time, because it's not linear, you don't forget the, about the narrative, because you don't really have to remember a narrative, because there is no, no one narrative. Um, and that's, again, a point of discussion. Um, so, anyway. Um, so, that's kind of the starting point where I started creating my own um, heteronyms. And uh, these are the ones I have at the moment. Um, I, st I started... Where's the wrong time from? Um, I almost started working straight away when I started with my BA in 2003. I think I only worked for a year, two years, that I worked as myself, and then I already... It wasn't that I couldn't pick what I want to make, I just wanted to do everything. And I didn't want to make the decision, I, you have to do this or you have to do that. I thought, from my point of view, it was ridiculous that as an artist you have to do one thing. Um, so from that point on, I started to look for different ways of how you could do that. Um, in the beginning, um, I used my own names. I have a much longer name. <laughs> um, my full name is Jeroen Gerardus Hubertus Benedictus van Doorn. Um, I have those names because I'm raised Catholic. Um, so the three other names are referring to my grandparents, and the last one is referring to a great uncle who was a Benedictine monk. <coughs> so <coughs> I started to work under those names at first. <coughs> and then I went to New York and to study there at <coughs> Hunter College. And then I started reading this, and I thought, oh, that's perfect. Before that, I came up with a lot of different um, I guess structures or excuses, either way is fine, uh, to find a way to work and to make as many different um, styles of work. Um, then I started reading this, so um, I couldn't really figure it out yet when I finished my BA, so when I finished my BA, a month after I had my first exhibition, and I made completely different new, new work, I came up with a my first heteronym, which is Fred Robeson, um, this guy. And I made new work and I had an exhibition as that, and I kind of forgot about everything I did before. So I, I just started my practice um, from scratch again. Um, so I started writing a biography. And in the beginning, it was quite difficult, you know, coming up with a name for your character. Um, where is it coming from? Um, so I just started writing um, kind of what the inspirations were of that character. So it was based on two characters, in one um, both uh, of different movies, one of movie Pi, the other one of the movie Lost Highway, and I kind of combined the two characters into a new character, which was more um, based on how those characters acted than necessarily what they were, because one was a saxophonist, and Fred is definitely not a saxophonist player. Um, I came up with where he was born, because uh, I felt I need to give him a place, uh, where he's from, and kind of from that I started thinking, what kind of art does he want to make? Um, what kind of job does he have? And um, yeah, kind of started working with that. Then if you see there his daughter Lana, that's a different, I'm not gonna talk about her today, really, uh, but that's a different heteronym of mine as well, which should be there as well, somewhere. Lana Robeson, yeah. 
Um, so it's a different character who makes completely different work. But um, then I made an artist statement because I felt an artist needs an artist statement to be able to make work. Um, so I basically went through the normal phases when you're an artist, the different things you do to, to make art and you have to do to kind of explain your work. But I did that before making work. Um, so I came up with the ideas before I started uh, making the actual work. So this is a long, long time ago, um, in 2008. So this was this and these two works um, were part of the first show I had. And it's, it was based on a biographical story he had. So when he was young, he, would, he, he was born in Faromp. So in summer he would drive with his parents and his brother Dave to uh, Salt Hill, uh, Salt Hill, not Salt Hill, uh, Salt Lake in um, Nevada, to to as as a holiday to, to you know to look at the landscapes and he would do it every year. So the, I'm kind of describing the trip he had in a sound piece, um, and then I started making these works kind of as a just as a start up of how to start thinking as somebody else, and it was like I said, very much based on um, kind of his living environment. And I kept doing that for a little bit. When I went to New York, I started taking pictures. I kept it to black and white. Um, and here you can also see um, the title, The Second Tavern, is a song title of a, in, of, a, of a spaghetti western movie. So the first ones were all kind of song titles. And I kept that, but then The Eyes of the World which is a song by The Strokes, which was a big kind of hit in, in 2007 when I was in New York. So it gets these interactions, it starts to get these interactions between me and him. Um, so I worked for that quite a while everywhere I went, he went and the other way around. Um, sometimes the works were made before we actually would go there and sometimes it was the other way around. Um, but it's kind of, these are based on, uh, on Finland. Um, these are kind of a mix of, of Finland and, and New York. Um, the technique is an image transfer technique. Um, so it's based on acrylics and inkia prints. Um, to really quickly say, if you would paint this with acrylic paint and you would stick it on the wall and you let it dry, then you can scrape it back and the image um, appears again. Um, I know now that 80 grams paper has three layers, um, so you can work with that how much opacity you want in your work. So the more you scrape back, the more the ink pops to the front again, and the more you see of the image. If you do less, then you have more kind of, it's more opaque and you see m less of the image. Which also means the image is in mirror when you do it, and you will make that mistake a few times when you start. Um, so, I started to get commissions as well. So this was all under the character's name, so I was not involved. So the commission was asked, and uh, was kind of came emailed in as being the character. Um, so the character showed up to do the work. So I worked there for a few months on the wall piece, um, pretending to be Fred. Um, which works to a certain degree, up until I was in a show in in, in Dublin, Dublin Contemporary, and the character was invited to come to um, the American Embassy, because all American artists were invited to go to the embassy that were part of the show. Um, then, of course, I couldn't go to the embassy because you have to go in with your passport, and so that, that just doesn't work out. And then you start thinking, okay, so, to a certain degree, I can make this work, but not completely. There's, there's a flaw somewhere here. Um, the character evolved, and I started using more materials as well that kind of had a relation to his work as an architect. So I started printing on, um, on concrete, sit on a panel, and then concrete, like skim it with concrete, and then the image transfer on top. Um, the same here. Um, this was the second time it went wrong again with a commission. Commissions are just difficult when you're a fictional, when you're a heteronym, it just doesn't work. Um, this came to a complete standstill, the, the, the commission, um, because they wanted it to be signed off 
on the, the real person, me, Jeroen, and not on the thread. Um, so I came to a standstill because I said, no, it needs to be on the him because he made the artwork and not me. Um, so in the end, um, it was a prize I won at the RCA. And then the head of my department, she kind of intervened. As he explained everything, in the end, it had to do with insurance. But they could have you know, said it in the beginning, then we wouldn't have had the whole conversation. So they needed somebody to point out if it would come falling down from the wall, somebody to blame, and you can't blame a fictional character because there's no, no insurance there. Um, so again, it made me think if this is working or not. It's really funny for me but nobody else is in, in on the story. You're all in on the story now because you know I made this and I'm telling you, but if not, it's just the character out there as, as a real person. Um, so I kept working. Um, this is concrete canvas, so I started using more materials that were related to his kind of artist statement, but also his job. So I started printing on concrete canvas, making more um, structures, um, also, the trees you saw before from Finland, and that were kind of the the mix between the the, um, the city and the kind of um, the environment. Um, he started using the materials that were kind of related directly from the environment, and took that in as as part of the work. Um, this was one of the last times. Um, when I did a commission, uh, not a commission, uh, a residency in, in uh, Chile, in, in um, Santiago de Chile. And so that was one of the first times that, because it was six weeks, it's quite difficult to be in character for six weeks, especially because you're talking to other people as well that you meet during your, uh, during your residency. And then kind of from time to time, it kind of feels a little bit wrong. It feels like you're lying while well, you're not really lying, but you are, in fact, a little bit. Um, so that got me thinking again. Uh, I made a bit more work, and then um, I decided I need to do more research into Pessoa and how he um, kind of how he approached the the relation between himself and the heteronyms. And then I found this piece of text. And again, um, you kind of have to read the introduction in the back, which I did not do in the beginning. I just read the book. Um, so I missed this. And this is really important because here he says, in, in a way, how he, not only how he writes in these characters, which was important for me to, to see as well, but more so that he's really open about his characters and that he you know, he, he admits in a way that these are, um, these are characters, so he's not hiding behind them. He, it's more, um, he uses more as a creative practice instead of kind of like you sometimes do with a pseudonym to hide behind a pseudonym for whatever reason. Sometimes you have a really good reason um, to hide behind a pseudonym, especially um, if you look at the time he wrote it, early, um, about 1900, um, when women were not supposed to write, a pseudonym would be very helpful to be able to write. And the same at the moment when you're in a political, unstable country, it's good to have a pseudonym so you're not being blamed for everything. Um, but this is a creative practice, so it's not a political thing. It's, it's how can I write in a different persona? How can I write as um, and think as a different uh, character. So this is a different character, is Case for Langfeld, but um, I'm gonna talk about him a bit later. But I started, I started with just having my name as the artist and kind of move uh, the character as part of the title of the work. Just to, in a way as a start, to let other people in on what I was doing. Because before it was, I could have a show somewhere, but nobody knew because it was this character. Um, and it was really never my intention to hide behind it, it just kind of happened. Um, so I started to look at different ways of how I could be in, how other people could be in on my practice and how other people could see what I was doing with the different development of different fictional characters within fine art. 
and because that was what really interested me, but because I was hiding behind it, nobody saw it. So it's just a little step, um, but I started doing that. I started using my own name, and then I still want to refer to the characters, so they became part of the title. Um, I started looking at, um, at looking how I could um, explain to people as well where they were coming from. Um, because when you do the writing, you, and this again has to do with sort of with the hiding, um, you can write a fictional character, but um, you don't really explain where it's coming from. A lot of the characters come from me. Um, it's basically I take a little thing of me and I blow it up. Sometimes it's my family history, sometimes it's certain things um, I'm thinking or certain things I'm going through. Um, and when I look at his writing, he kind of does the same thing. It's not always based on this character has this job, he's living here, he's looking like this. Um, sometimes it's just this character is experiencing this and he's writing in such a way because um, of the person he is. So if you look at the, to come back at the book again, if you look at the book, like I said in the beginning, it's not really a biography in the sense of this is what I experienced but it's more a biography of this is what I'm thinking. Um, so I started looking more into those kind of things. So what am I actually thinking when I'm, when I'm making the art in kind of as that character? Um, one of the things you enter then is that you start having a relationship with your, with your characters. You know, you start having an interaction with them. And so in, again, in the appendix, um, he has this kind of, which I really liked, it was entirely by chance that I got to know Vincent Guedes. Um, so it's like, it's as if he meets this person, as if it's a real person. Um, which I thought is a really interesting way of looking at how you can um, develop a hat on him. Um, and then he explains a little bit how, what they were doing and how they were getting more familiar to each other, um, which is, again, in, in the appendix, but it's important if you think about the start of the book, how he started writing about the book, and that initially the first heteronym was this person. It's interesting to see how he met this person before he started reading the book, although the book is written by somebody else. But Bernardo Soares, as we saw earlier, is based on this character. So it's interesting to see that whole, um, the way of thinking through the book, but also the way of thinking outside of the book, the things that happen um, outside the actually the different text he has in the book, um, how that kind of infuses in, in, it's almost like a myth behind the book and how he, he uses that. So I started thinking about how do I relate to my heteronyms? What is, what is our connection? Another text that I found um, interesting also in this, um, in this perspective is how is again another character, uh, Alvaro de Campos, and he writes about him. But what's interesting for me in that is he never stopped being mischievous, however meddling at frequent intervals in his creator's real world life. So again, it's a reference to Fernando Pessoa himself. And you can see the last, in, there's quite a bit of humor as well in how he deals with these different characters. So one of his characters, Alvaro de Campos, wrote a letter to his apparently only um, lover or platonic lover, it's not completely clear, saying he should dump Pessoa. So one of his characters writes that to his, his girlfriend. So it's kind of this humor, in, in this humor and openness in, in his different characters and how he, how he approaches all of this. Um, so of course I went back to my practice again and thinking, so how can I um, how can I do that? Which is, in a fine art practice, quite complicated, I discovered. Um, so this is a different character. So this is Tom. Um, so I started again with writing um, the kind of a short biography, where he's coming from and all of that. Um, again, his influences, the artists he's looking at and kind of um, how he lives life. And then I also start to include myself into the kind of context of Tom to see how I relate to it, but also how, 
how them and me can influence each other. So how, you know, where is, in a way, where is my identity in relation to their identities? And how can they, in a way, live in the same, in the same world? And also, where do they start? Where they, do they come from? So, like I said a little bit earlier, um, I often start with picking this little thing that I experience, or you know, my family history, or you know, anything that is little, and I blow it up. I blow it out of proportion. So, in the beginning, it's me, but quite quickly, it, it becomes them, uh, because it's so far removed from me that I can't say it's me anymore. It's just this different, you know, this different person. Um, so I started in my writing doing this as well, how they relate. Um, then I started, and that was from my point of view, so I also started to look from their point of view how they, how they look at me. And I started looking into different writing styles. Um, so here is that same character, Tom, he's writing me a letter about his life. So I'm starting to have this interaction with him and um, in a way talking to him like Pessoa sometimes does with his characters as well when he, for example, writes a letter to his, his partner, there's kind of a similar interaction. And when you read the book, you see more of those interactions. I mean, you, you look more into Pessoa, you see more of those interactions. But again, a lot of it is in the margins of the books and it's about the writing of the book or his intentions about the book that you can see those, um, those things come forward. Um, so I started doing that. Um, I'm just showing some work so you kind of know what comes out of this as well. So I made, I'm just gonna show only a few works. Um, the thing I'm just gonna say, like if you look at, for example, um, if you know Juan Muñoz, the Spanish um, um, artist, sculptor, so there was an influence, as you can see in the second paragraph, of him. So I started looking at him and not exactly copying, but obviously being heavily inspired by him. Um, Cunyos obviously uses much more detail and um, he uses kind of a raisin cast with the clothing and everything being one. And I started kind of having a variation of that as a start of a new practice. Um, and I guess most artists um, do that in the beginning. In the beginning, you kind of look at the people that inspire you and you start kind of doing a little bit of copying to kind of start working in that style and start kind of getting a feel for where you want to go with your artworks. So I do that a lot. I, every time when I start a new character, I look at artists that might inspire that character and I start making the first work that kind of, um, in a way, are in the same family as, as the artists that inspire the character. Um, so I started doing this with, with the other characters as well. So the same again with Kay's. Um, um, again, kind of biographical, what is what he's inspired by and where is his relation to me? So where did it start that idea of, of, um, of Kay's? And in a way it's, it's uh, it started really simple from, um, you know, I, I still enjoy it, like crunchy leaves. I think it's brilliant and every crunch leaf that is dry, I will, I will still step on it just because I like the sound. And I think a lot of people have these, I guess, quirks, uh, maybe not stepping on a leaf, but maybe something else that just you do because you like it and it has no function or it's, it's maybe a bit silly or maybe some people might say childish, but you still kind of do it because you just like it. Um, so he started like that, and then the name von Langfeld is based on my, uh, my grandmother of my dad's side. So I started again getting some of my family back in there. Um, I did this because my grandmother lived her whole life in, in the same village. Um, she turned she was 92, so she was old, very curious, always looking outside, see what's happening outside. Um, so the character is based on a last name also because this character lives in that village. Um, so his surroundings and his kind of, um, uh, some other of the writing about him is about the village where I'm born as well and where I lived until I was 18. It's a tiny village, 4,000 people, so it's kind of everybody knows 
everybody. And in some of the writing, um, he meets people in the village when, he was, when he's walking outside that actually people that I know from the village. Um, his writing style is very much in line with his character, which is, has his obsessive personality. Um, his obsession is that he wants, really, really wants you to know what he's saying. So the writing becomes very repetitive. So he's saying the same sentence, but in a lot of different ways. And you kind of see that back in the work as well. Um, so his work is about him um, starting walking in the morning around 8 o'clock, walking to work, which costs him about half an hour, and arriving at work. And he notes down the times, he notes down, notes down uh, the weather, and he notes down the colors of the cars he's seeing. So on Monday he counts red cars, Tuesday orange cars, Wednesday yellow cars, Thursday green cars, and Friday blue cars. So and he orders them in, in, kind of in, in different color shades. Um, so when he walks, he kind of has a little book with him, which I made as well, and then he kind of um, makes notes with, with color he sees. Um, so I did performances, and sometimes I do the performance myself, sometimes um, I let other people do the performance. Um, I'm not asking actors, I'm in general asking people that I know are similar to the character. I tell them beforehand, so don't worry that I um, might use man. He is kind of, he's a little bit like that. Um, he's quite um, obsessed, but in a good way. Um, so this performance was him talking for a little bit about the project, and then he starts into kind of this um, almost mantra of naming all the different colors. But every time when somebody new, new walks into the room, he starts from the front because he wants everybody to hear it from the front to the back. Um, the reason why I made this character do that because um, obsession can come with frustration as well, that you have to do something, although you don't want to do it, you have to do it. Um, and I wanted the audience that was already in the room to feel this as well, this kind of frustration of not being able to finish something that you really want to finish. Um, so kind of I, in, in the performances, I let those elements of the characters come uh, back as well. And with this one is, is in a way similar to this performance. Um, he started with his, his biography, so where he's coming from and kind of uh, biographical um, information. Then he started explaining about his project, about counting cars. And then the last four hours is really repetitive. Um, uh, basically saying, um, for example, I left at 8 or 5 in the morning, um, it was a sunny day, I arrived at um, 8.25, I counted this many cars in this color. And those are 245 colors, so 5 times 49. Um, so he went every square, he went with, um, he didn't finish it, which was not good for the character, but the gallery closed, so um, I had to finish. Um, but again, um, when somebody would walk in of the audience, um, he would start talking to them and asking if they understood what he was doing. So this repetition again, and this, again, this idea of I have to tell you what I'm doing, uh, came, back, came back in this performance as well. Then Fred Robeson, who you just saw all the, the works with the, the trees and the, um, the cities, um, I had to rewrite some of his character and see where it was coming from and kind of how it represent, how it relates to me. And then I also wrote again how he looks at me. And with Fred, because we're so kind of close related in a way, um, so for Fred, I'm the heteronym, but for me, he is the heteronym. So um, in his kind of idea and in his writing, he kind of created me, which gave me kind of this look how it would be if I would be a character. So again, stepping in their shoes and see how he would write about me and how um, um, this idea of, of having an identity and how people look at you 
I'm kind of playing with that. So he's playing when he's walking outside that people recognize him as me. But he says, but I'm not him, I'm, I'm myself. So it's this kind of um, this idea that came from the beginning of him when people thought I was Fred, but actually I was me. So I reversed the roles and made him experience what I experienced. Um, so then um, I did the, the, the last bit of, of what I'm telling today is still a bit, but it's about two shows I had. And um, I kind of worked with this title for a bit um, in different shows, and this is probably the last time I'm going to use that title. Um, so for this, I had different characters um, doing a performance together because I was interested in, in not only how to, you know, how they relate to me, but also how they relate to each other. So I started in a way curating the different characters together and more based again on, um, I guess, on the state of mind and my state of mind. Um, Again, I, I, I questioned what my role in this bit was. It's, I'm, I'm still thinking about um, how that relates to me. But I also wanted to think about, because sometimes it becomes too internal, and I don't want it because it's, it's not meant to be internal. It's meant external because I do fine arts, like writing as well. It's, it's an external thing you're doing. Um, so I kind of, in my writing, I started writing as well in how the general public would look at something like that instead of just me looking at that. Uh, so from my point of view, it's kind of a turmoil a lot of people have, like all of these different ideas constantly making your head completely full and you know, not being able to think straight. Um, so I thought this is kind of as well what we are experiencing, a lot of us, um, especially with COVID and sitting at home alone, but also with all the distractions we have, like our mobile devices, all our social media, and then we have a job, and we have study, and we have all you know, our friends, our family. So there's a lot of different things going on at the same time in your mind. Uh, so I want to people kind of feel that with this, um, with this performance. So it's built out of three characters, three elements. So the first one is me as being Case, walking in between um, these two prints, and it was built out of five different, no, ten different elements. Um, I would start with a, a kind of a biographical narrative why he, um, how he started this kind of, of how his obsession started in the beginning when he was very young. And that all the way up to in five different um, stories, all the way in the end to how he made the works, how he came to making the works. And in between that, I had him um, call out the 49 different colors. So it was a biographical story, then 49 colors of, of red, which refers to the Monday, then biographical story, 49 colors of orange, which was the Tuesday, and so forth until Friday he was doing all the blue colors. And then the last blue color kind of um, referred to the same how he ended his biographical um, story. So that's me walking up and down. So I had these characters. It says uh, Pasisteia Kneind. Pasisteia is kind of a goddess of, um, of relaxation and meditation, hallucinations. She kind of is dealing with that. And then Kneind is um, my dialect for rabbit. So I kind of made that as the, the new character. And I had three of them. And every five minutes, uh, it was a half an hour scripted performance. Um, and every five minutes, another uh, rabbit would appear. So the, the space where, where, people, where the people were performing were getting more crowded and more crowded kind of referring to all the different things that happen in our lives and that kind of sometimes might be a bit overwhelming. Um, so the goal of the rabbits was to distract Case, who was kind of pacing up and down and reciting all the colors. Then the last one that was uh, Will Finns, which is also kind of a performance character. And I wrote, I rewrote um, the script of, um, what's the movie called again? 
of Network is a film of 1976, and this is one scene that he is, um, he is a news uh, reader, and he goes off script, and he has this one piece of text, and um, so he starts to kind of walk towards the camera and starts kind of getting more agitated and kind of screaming into the camera. And I kind of did the same, I rewrote it more into uh, contemporary text. Uh, the last bit is, I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore, not going to take this anymore. It's going to be louder and louder and louder. So he was kind of walking and he started in the audience. So he kind of started where you guys are and kind of started his dialogue there as kind of, because I want to have that transition from a normal person to somebody who is quite angry about something. Um, and I wanted him to to be part of the audience first and then become part, become a performer. Um, so when he did his last bit of I'm mad as hell, I'm not going to take it anymore, it was also kind of all the rest of the performers kind of went off stage and then that was the end of the performance. So it was kind of working towards this really loud and busy, um, busy ending whilst it started really kind of tranquil and kind of almost meditative. Um, so I want to have that, that interaction between um, the different characters, but also I want to bring it more into kind of like something the audience might get more into than just everything being about, you know, related to me. Um, but I was still not really, in a way, in there myself. I was there as a curator, in a way, which is a role I could take in relation to my characters. I could curate them, which I've done before. But I also want to see how I could be in, in a way, in with the, the, in with the different characters and how I can relate to them. Um, so this was my, my five uh, exhibition where I, where I tried that. Um, this might not always be the best idea to try something new in, uh, in your FIFA, but it worked out for me. Um, so I'm just going to go through the work so you can see the works. Yeah. Um, so I had uh, my partner, she drew uh, portraits of me, like you saw in the beginning of the first slide. She, I asked her to draw different per portraits of me and ask her to do it in a specific way so they would represent that specific character but still being me, kind of as a relation between me and the different characters. So I would be in there with them in a, in a way next to um, the artwork. I also, instead of having different performers, um, I did my, my presentation wasn't a presentation for my Viva, but it was a performance. So I did a 10 minute performance switching between myself and um, that is Tom Singer, Case van Langfeld and, and Fred Robeson. So I kind of went in between the different roles to kind of, that it's all kind of coming from me from my, in a way from my body in a sense, but it is at the same, a, a different person, a different character. So, for example, for Case, my, my talking about his work was really repetitive. It was kind of the same sentence, but in, in a slightly different way. So each of the different performances was, um, was spoken in such a way that it referred to the, to the, to the heteronym. Uh, that's why I needed to have that voice, what you saw earlier on, the writing, you know, that Tom wrote the letter and um, Case wrote the really repetitive text, um, Fred wrote as if um, he was me. That was really important for this to be able to, to talk in, in a different voice and talk in a different way in, in relation to the work. And then this work is slightly different as well because in a way this is a work about the work, it's not the work itself. Um, you saw that work earlier, the alphabetical, and you saw it hanging from the, from the ceiling. So in a way, this becomes more reflective to the character as well, so it is more related to me talking about this character instead of the character showing the work. Yeah, if that makes sense. Um, and I think that's it. I think, how long are we talking? Probably long enough or not.
I almost forgot that. Yeah, it's almost an hour. Okay. I'm just going to leave that.